I'll, uh, I'll get going. I know we're, we're, uh, got sh we're short on time. So um, uh, I have three key points to make. Uh, I'm going to make them you know, very briefly in the time we have, but you get the longer version if you look at the secret of our success, as John mentioned. So the first point I want to make is that humans are a cultural species. And by cultural species, I mean two separate things. So one is that over hundreds of thousands of years, and possibly for millions of years, cultural evolution has been central in driving our species' genetic evolution. And this makes us quite unlike other animals and has taken us off on a different evolutionary trajectory, a distinct evolutionary trajectory. As a consequence of this gene culture co-evolution, we're a species addicted to culture. So when we're placed in the environments in which we evolve, we can't survive unless we get that a non-genetic download of information that's been accumulating in uh, our cultural inheritance system separate from our, our genetic inheritance system. This also makes us different from other animals. So part of this means that to do evolutionary psychology, you need to think not only about the genetic processes we, we need to think about for other species, but also the interaction between genes and culture over long periods of time. Now, I also want to very briefly show you how we can dissolve the intellectually destructive dichotomy that's often set up between culture and learning on one side and, quote, biological or evolutionary explanations on the other side by turning evolutionary thinking and natural selection on how we learn. There's a number of different ways we can do that. And then finally, uh, the last point I want to make is, is to consider the possibility of expanding psychology to make it historical science. I'm going to leave that a little bit mysterious. All right. So uh, now, in order to make this point that humans are addicted to culture, I want to dip into what Rob Boyd and I call the lost European explorer files. There's a whole chapter in the book on what we can learn from lost European explorers. But I have to make a long story short. So this is the story of Burke and Wills in uh, 1860. And if you're Australian, you've heard of them. If you're not, you, you probably haven't. They were the first Europeans to travel across the interior of Australia, a continent of hunter-gatherers only, until the Europeans arrived. They went from Melbourne up to the Gulf of Carpentaria and then back down. And then things were really going wrong. They couldn't find food. They had trouble with water. Most of their camels had died. And they ended up stranded along Cooper's Creek. Uh, they were making a run for a, poli a police station and outpost, prophetically enough, uh, next to a mountain called Mount Hopeless, uh, which, which they never got there. Uh, but they got stranded because their last camel got stuck in the mud and died. And they couldn't carry enough water across the desert to make it. So they just had to stick by the creek because they didn't have the knowledge to find water in the desert. Uh, I mentioned they couldn't hunt or fish successfully, but they did meet a local aboriginal group, a group of hunter-gatherers, and they were able to get occasional gifts of fish from these guys. And they noticed the women uh, were processing a sporocarp, like a seed, and they were grinding it into a powder and making little cakes about it. So these guys are good Victorian Englishmen, so they, they figured, well, we can make bread. So they managed to finally find some of the nardo, and they, they ground it up, and they made cakes and gruel and stuff. And it seemed like they were going to have enough calories. They were getting the fish from the, from the locals. So it seemed like they might make it. The problem was is what they didn't notice is that the women were not only grinding the powder or the sporocarps, they were leaching it, heating it, and then only eating it with a mussel shell, or they were grinding it, leaching it, and then baking it in ash. And this is a special way of processing nardo that's necessary because it's toxic and indigestible because it has an enzyme in it called thiamase, which depletes the B1 in your body and eventually gives you an awful condition called beriberi. So these guys, and, and uh, William Wills is actually writing down in his journal the whole time, so you get the, his experience of, of starving to death and being gradually poisoned by this. So uh, Burke and Wills die, and their third member of their party, King, wanders off into the desert and is rescued by the Yawantru, and eventually rescued by uh, a party from Melbourne. All right. Now, the, the, the moral of this story is that Burke and Wills, with months in the, in the outback to try to figure out how to survive, uh, couldn't figure it out. So their instincts were insufficient, no modules fired up, and no generalized intelligence was allowed them to do basic things like find water or identify plants. Uh, they couldn't effectively make the spears, traps, and fish hooks that the locals use. Now this is contrasted with their camels. So some of their camels escaped, and Central Australia is full of feral camels who have taste and scent cues that allow them to triangulate in on the right food, and they can actually smell water from a mile away. So the, the camels outconformed the Euro lost European explorers. What they were missing was the stuff that a local uh, Yawantru adolescent would have had, which is this large body of information that's bequeathed to them and is accumulated slowly and often unconsciously, uh, which allows you to, to do all these things. All right, so uh, that gives you the idea that we're really addicted to culture in a way that other species aren't, and we're dependent on this cumulative body. 
Now, this, to get into this, we, I'll give you a, uh, one example of how we can begin to use the, the logic of natural selection to think about cultural learning. So you can ask the question, how might natural selection have shaped our minds to most effectively access the valuable information that's stored in, in the minds and behaviors of the other members of our social group? And you can think about what kinds of content we should pay attention to, who we should pay attention to, and how we should integrate these different sources of information. There's different lines of theory on that. I'll just mention the who you should pay attention to, because there's been a lot of recent work on this. So learners can use cues. They can look at who's the most skillful or, success or uh, competent. They can pay attention to more general cues of success. They can even use cues of prestige, as, as John mentioned. Rather than assessing success, they can look at who other people are deferring to, paying attention to, giving the floor, listening to, and they can use that to figure out who they want to zero in and learn from. You can also use cues of age. Young kids can scaffold up to increasingly complex skills by paying attention to kids a bit older than them. And older people, since not everybody gets to be old, if there's very old people in the community, they, they've actually gone through a filter. Natural selection has already knocked some of them out. Uh, so that contains a kind of information. And then finally, self-similarity cues, like uh, being the same sex or using the same dialect, can help learners customize the knowledge that's going to be most useful to them later in life. And, th and there's actually been a whole research program now in developmental psychology, which comes together with older work by people like Albert Bandura in social psychology, um, providing evidence for these kinds of use of these cues in young children and even, and even babies. So we find these cues and this cultural learning to be important in a vast number of domains. So food preferences, mate choice, technological adoption, even suicide patterns seem to show uh, evidence of these kinds of cues. Uh, they develop early, they're automatic, they're often unconscious. So they, have, they fit many of the requirements for a, for a psychological adaptation. Okay, now once the community is using this, this can give rise to what we call cultural adaptations. So by keying in on the more successful, more competent, more prestigious members of a community, over time without anybody realizing, you can get increasingly complex products. Things like complex tools of the kind that you want to use, um, food processing like how to process nardo. I have some examples up here of uh, complex patterns that uh, people in small scale societies have that are very adapted to their local environment but they're products of this cumulative cultural evolution. It can also give rise to social norms and institutions. And all of these can potentially influence our psychology and give rise to culture, cultural psychological differences among populations. Okay, but the, now we get to the gene culture co-evolutionary part of this theory. Once you get this process going the, you, of adaptive cultural evolution, you'll begin the, the things in our ancestral environments that would have been some of the most important selection pressures, along with others that are non-cultural, uh, are themselves products of cultural evolution. So here in the, in the black, that, these are going to be the products of cultural evolution, and then they lead to hypotheses about pieces of evolved psychology that you wouldn't get if you didn't have cumulative cultural evolution in your species. So my, one of my favorite examples is from my colleague Richard Rangham. And uh, Richard has done kind of com uh, comparative physiology, comparative anatomy on human digestion. So our teeth are too small for a primate of our size, our stomachs are too small, our colons are too short. They only make sense if a species is dependent on fire and cooking. Uh, and because cook cooking and fire kind of pre-digest the food, so you don't need as much digestive machinery as you would otherwise. But the interesting thing about fire and cooking is we're not innately very good at it. I have lots of lost European explorer tales where they really needed to be able to make fire and they couldn't make fire. So it's not something that we can just do, we have to acquire it by, by cultural transmission. But then the spread of this ability then shaped us by leading to cooking and, and transformed our physiology. You can make the same case for a whole suite of running adaptations we have in our sweating system. This logic can't work unless you have culturally evolved knowledge about tracking and water containers. So it's a package of genes and culture that are resulting in these different adaptations. I'm going to uh, breeze over these, but it, in developmental psychology, there's a large research program on our uh, reliably developing uh, cognitive abilities for, for organizing knowledge about plants and animals, and also for thinking about artifacts. And these only make sense in a world where there are complex artifacts that one has to learn about, or where there is a large body of knowledge about plants and animals that one has to acquire, organize, and, and whatnot. Potentially of more interest uh, to social psychologists, are the fact that once we can distinguish different abilities of skill and knowledge in our group, this can give rise to a second form of status, prestige status. And this leads to a separate set of ethologies, a suite of emotional and affective responses that is distinct from what we get from being a primate, our dominance hierarchy. So this, this lays out a kind of foundational level approach to, to human status. <clears throat> 
Cultural evolution also give, gives rise to social norms, and I've argued that we have a norm psychology that helps us learn the rules for navigating our social world to avoid getting punished and, and actually to punish others as well. And finally, cultural learning also shapes the world. So it, it leads to groups in which people have similar norms and they, they speak different languages or use different dialects. And now the learner, the person in the world, has to be able to navigate that world. So a psychology in which we think about ethnic groups in particular ways um, and make certain assumptions about them. So an evolved cultural psychology. Okay, so that gives you a little bit of sense of the gene culture co-evolutionary psychology, which I am trying to make part of the broader program uh, in evolutionary approaches to human behavior. Now let me get to the historical sciences part with a kind of little microcosm of this. Um, so your brain, and I feel very confident that this is true of everyone in the room, has been shaped by the acquisition of a particular skill. Most people in most societies' brains have not been shaped in this particular way. So this, this learning the skill has thickened your corpus callosum. It's specialized the circuitry in your left ventral occipital region of your brain, developed uh, after about age eight. It's altered your superior temporal succulus and, and left inferior uh, prefrontal cortex or Broca's area. It's improved your verbal memory and when you hear speech you get broader patterns of activation than people who lack this skill. Um, it's shifted your face recognition from being equal on the two hemispheres of your brain to being uh, right dominant and it's made you worse at identifying faces. I'm sure m most of you have guessed what this is, but you're highly literate. So uh, literate populations are biologically different from non-literate populations. They're not genetically different, they're biologically different. It's important to keep those separate. Now, uh, the unwitting neuroscientist might study a bunch of people and come to the conclusion that humans are right hemisphere dominant for face processing, but of course, this is a product of being in highly literate populations where most people learn to read. So you can come to the wrong conclusions. Um, now, this means that on our particular cultural evolutionary trajectory, you've affected our facial cognition and basic verbal memory. And it's the details of our writing system that actually matter here because if you look at Mayan script, which existed for 600 years, the Mayans actually used faces as part of their script. So it's hard to imagine they would have lost their face processing abilities. We, we don't actually have any Mayans to, or, who, who are still literate to, to test that off with. Um, so then you can ask the question of how would we explain the origins of this interesting pattern of cultural psychology? Well, just the evolution of the technology of writing doesn't explain it. Um, so for, for millennia, people were, um, uh, there was literacy in writing and stuff, but it was a very small percentage of the population, 10% or less. So you can have to ask the question, why was there a period, suddenly it turns out it's uh, sometime in the 16th century, when people become increasingly literate? And I think the best explanation from historians is religion. So Protestantism gets this idea that individuals need to be able to read the Bible in their own language and interpret it for themselves. It's a crazy idea in cross-cultural perspective, but these Protestant individualists had this idea that they needed. So everybody had to become literate, and here you can see the, the spread of literacy in England and France, the, the bottom one's illiteracy. Now, it's important to remember there's a biological change here occurring. Corpus callosi are thickening as people are becoming highly literate. So you're seeing a biological change in historical time. Okay. Now, you might say, well, this is just some, this is just weird, uh, well, weird, um, uh, uh, example dealing very, very specific to uh, reading, not important for other aspects of psychology, but I could show you page after page of plots that look like this, where, so this is, um, Conformity, so this is the size of the conformity effect in the ASH test. This is uh, compiled by Damien Mary. This is weird people and the rest of the world. Um, this is the Mueller liar illusion. This is weird people. This is hunter gatherers. They don't have the illusion. This is the dictator game done, doing, done systematically across diverse societies. These are the Americans here at this end. That's the hunter gatherers here at this end and the world's quite variable. And I can go on and on. You can do this for moral judgment, the importance of intentions, the endowment effect in-group favoritism, aspects of memory, and all this. So there, you know, you're studying the population that's most different in the world. Now I think we can begin to, to do, so a lot of, um, we can use evolutionary theory and the emergence, the, the, the ideas that we then develop from that for cultural evolution to explain the patterns of variation that cultural psychologists are documenting. And what, well, there's a research program I think for, for psychologists in trying to link causally between the psychological patterns we're finding across diverse societies and the non-psychological things that might be causing them. So I've given you one example here of, of reading and literacy and how that can lead to neurological and psychological changes. 
the use of carpenter corners of the 90 degree corners that are our doors and our rooms and our tables might help explain the Muller liar illusion that I showed you. Things like money are evolutionarily novel, but they may change our psychology in interesting and important ways. Clocks, calendars, these things all appeared over historical time, and we now can use them as mental tools. Perhaps more important are institutions. So my colleagues and I at UBC have used, have been studying religion and documenting how different religions have quite different effects on human psychology. Many psychologists have begun increasingly to study rituals and how these affect psychology. But there are, of course, many more rituals in the world than you could ever study by just focusing on, on the populations typically studied by psychologists. Marriage systems are important. Probably most of, well, I know there's at least two exceptions in the room, but most of you have probably never studied people who don't live in a society with normative monogamy. But it turns out that even male testosterone functions differently over the life course when you're in a polygynous society where you're on the mating market your entire life and you can increase your status by taking more wives than if you're in a society where you can only take, take one wife at a time. And this has a bunch of psychological implications for male psychology, and you would need to study diverse human societies to get at this. Um, things like schools probably have a big effect on IQ. IQ doesn't seem to increase unless you're going to school. There's at least some preliminary evidence on that. And finally, there's a, a lot of work on uh, uh, languages. So languages vary in an immense number of dimensions. Um, of course, psychologists have documented some of this, but there's lots more to do. Um, my favorite one is the Matisse who, and I think everybody should, I think this should become part of English, but when they speak, they have to grammatically distinguish between things they know uh, because they saw it, they were an eyewitness, versus things they heard about. So they got to distinguish hearsay from direct evidence and, and grammatically. So that means when they're speaking, they're, they constantly have to attend to this. And so these are products of cultural evolution, which potentially can have big impacts on our psychology. Okay, so um, what I've tried to do very briefly here, and I do in more detail in The Secret of Our Success, is develop an overarching framework that can take this scattered findings, um, not only in psychology, but in other disciplines, and pull them together into an organized framework. One of the key things I'm trying to do is to seat humans within the natural world, explain them using the same principles that we use to explain other animals, but take into account that we've had this unique gene culture coevolutionary trajectory. Um, the product, uh, the approach generates uh, deductive predictions, in, you know, the way that um, more traditional or um, o older, older, older forms of, uh, of evolutionary psychology generate deductive predictions, but here you also get predictions um, from gene culture coevolutionary models, and you get predictions about cultural variation, and I, well, some of the ones I've hinted at. And then finally, I've talked about uh, culture, uh, cultural evolutionary psychology, and I've kind of begun to sketch out a research program where psychologists can link institutions and rituals and religions and technologies to aspects of psychology. Now, in order to tackle this research program, it means that you have to go beyond just focusing on studying undergraduates. You need to take advantage of the world and go out and study societies that have polygynous marriage or have age sets and have quite different rituals that people have to experience, speak very different languages where you have to attend to evidence whenever you're speaking, the, the, the quality of your evidence. So I guess this is like, a, I would like to you know, call people to head out into the world and exploit the, the variation that still exists and we can then use this to inform uh, the history and the, the emergence of our, of our weird psychological uh, capacities. <laughs>